Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Rebka Tespamariam. I'm the class of 2018. I'm a current second year medical student at Toro College of Osteopathic Medicine in Harlem, New York. On behalf of the college and Bowdoin College Black Alumni Association, BCBAA, we're glad you joined us today as we celebrate Black History Month and highlight one of our very own Black alumni. As BCBAA crossed the one-year mark at the last year, I'd offer a few highlights of their work. Over the last year, we visited campus twice, reunion and homecoming, and been able to connect with and deepen relationships with our Black community. This semester, we are piloting an alumni student mentorship program that has already shown great promise for students and alumni alike. Overall, we are building relationships with fellow alumni, campus partners, and students for long-term sustainability for the entire Bowdoin community. This event today is just one example of BCBAA's efforts, and to learn more, visit the BCBAA section of the alumni website. Okay, to now turn to today's event. I'm joined today by two Bowdoin students, Junior Fuje and Senior Jada. Jada Afuje, please tell everyone a little bit about yourself as we get started. Thanks so much, Repka. Uh, I'm glad to be here with you and the entire Bowdoin community. I'm Foji Tendo from the class of 2024. I'm majoring in biochemistry and math, and I'm a member, member of the Bowdoin Rowing Club and Bowdoin Peer Health. And, and yeah, we're really excited to have a conversation with Terry today, and I think this would be really great. Uh, but before we get started, we should cover some basic housekeeping. Uh, so please note today's conversation is being recorded live and streamed to Bowdoin.edu. And for guests who are joining via Zoom, the Q&A feature is available and only the moderators will be able to review your questions. So we will begin to offer them to our speaker in the last 15 minutes. So please keep that in mind. Don't forget. And yeah, Jada, I think that's all I have. Please take it away. Thanks, Foji and Rebka. Um, I'm glad to be here with you all and the entire Bone community. Um, my name is Jada Scotland, class of 23. I'm majoring in neuroscience and minoring in anthropology. Um, and at Bowdoin, I'm a head RA, a captain of the track and field team, and a vice president of the Athlete of Color Coalition. And yes, we're so excited to have a conversation with Terry today. Um, and before we start, I'd like to share a little bit about her. Um, Dr. Terry Young, 81, chairwoman of the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Sciences at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, is a pediatric ophthalmologist and clin a clinician scientist with expertise in ophthalmic genetics and genomics in the area of refractive error, ocular development, and childhood glaucoma. So let's begin with our first question. Um, Dr. Young, how did you decide Bowdoin was the place you wanted to go to college? Yes, thank you. First of all, I'd just like to thank you all and the organizers um, and the school for inviting me to talk today. This is an incredible honor. I, you know, I think when you're a Bowdoin student, you don't ever expect to be um, a few decades later doing this, but I'm, I'm just truly honored to be able to, to share a little bit about um, my work in my life with you. Um, I actually was an accidental uh, college student and actually an accidental Bowdoin student. I, um, I grew up in Detroit, Michigan, uh, went to Cass Technical High School to magnet school in, uh, in uh, downtown Detroit. It was eight blocks. I mean, it was an entire city block, eight stories up, not a blade of grass around it. Uh, we didn't have a football team or um, you know, any kind of team sports, quite honestly. Um, and so when I started looking at colleges, I, I wanted to go to a, a smaller college. My, my high school was 5,000 students, a smaller college in a more rural setting uh, where I could actually see trees. I, I just thought that would be a, a good thing. And so I looked at the, um, the liberal arts colleges, like the mini Ivy League, if you will, liberal arts colleges as they were described at the time. And Bowdoin was ranked number one uh, in Barron's Guide of Colleges, uh, which um, was a big telephone book of um, sort of the statistics of each college at the time. Uh, we didn't have internet back then. Um, and so I just thought, hmm, okay, uh, maybe I'll, I'll put in my application there. Um, another uh, appealing aspect was the fact that uh, at the time they had decided not to 
uh, weigh SAT scores uh, that well because I, I actually was never a great um, standardized test taker. Um, but I was a good student and um, that's that's how I found out about Bowdoin and, uh, and uh, applied and, and got in and uh, Bowdoin was uh, uh, gracious enough to also offer me a scholarship uh, to attend. It was a, uh, a student athlete scholarship. I, I swam and, uh, and played on uh, Bowdoin's tennis teams. Amazing, Terry. So our second question is, so you have an AB from Bowdoin, an MD from Harvard, and an MD, MBA from Duke. That's incredible. Uh, can you talk to us about your MD, MBA choice and how this has shaped your career? Certainly. Well, um, I was a biochem major and a sociology minor at Bowdoin. Um, I'd always loved science and math. Um, I had, uh, and this is sort of an unusual background, I, I coming from Detroit and actually attending that particular uh, magnet school attracted the attention of Ford Motor Company. Um, and so the summer between my uh, senior year in high school and then first year in college and then subsequent years, I was employed at uh, Ford Motor Company to work in their uh, research and design lab. And I specifically in the, in the chemistry lab uh, developing uh, different kinds of slurries, if you will, for catalytic converters. Um, and that taught me two things. One was that what I was learning in the, um, you know, in school was actually applicable or translatable to, you know, sort of real life um, products or, um, you know, sort of a, a, a question that needed to be answered. And then the second thing was, you know, it, it truly helped me uh, monetarily too, to, you know, pay for expenses. Um, but I think that having that uh, early exposure in the lab also helped me to understand how I could apply that with my interest in biochemistry in particular. I wasn't a pre-med uh, student though. I didn't see myself doing that because I, I don't come from a family of doctors or even a family of, of college graduates. And, um, I was in classes with pre-med students, but didn't, didn't recognize that I had the same, um, even the same skill sets actually, certainly not the, the ambition to be a doctor. And it's just because it was not familiar to me. And it wasn't until quite literally, um, and I just wanna give a shout out to, you know, to these professors, Tom Settlemeyer, who was uh, in the department of chemistry and uh, William Steinert, who was um, in the in genetics, um, literally just sat me down at the, at the beginning of my senior year in college and said, so what are you going to do? And I said, so I think I'll just get a job. I mean, I'll, I'll probably get a job in a lab. And they said, nope, you're going to go to medical school. And I said, moi, basically. And they said, yes, you. And they, they basically um, uh, decided where I was going to apply. <laughs> And also, of course, uh, wrote letters of recommendation and um, even helped me with my personal statement. They, they were just so committed to this. I got swept up into it. And, um, you know, to my surprise, I got into, into Harvard. Um, and um, just, you know, again, I was going to say something about, you know, gratitude. You just have to count your blessings every day. And also, Recognize that there are helpers all around you if you're if you're if you're willing to to open your eyes to that and and these two really really were angels. Um, so I you know went to to medical school in Boston and um, I uh, was very uh, intrigued by uh, pediatrics. I thought I was going to be a pediatrician. I think in, in large part because that's really again all I knew as as a as a as a patient. Um, and I also just like the idea or the sense that, you know, these kids are innocent and they've got issues that, you know, with enough um, knowledge and, and even research applied to it, maybe we can we can find answers. And so that was my path until I had to do a uh, a two week clerkship just to get some credit, I thought I would do it in ear, nose, and throat because I thought, well, I'm going into peds. I need to figure out how to take out foreign bodies from different orifices. 
um, and had signed up to do two week rotation at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary to do ear, nose and throat otolaryngology is what it's formally called. And a couple days before I was supposed to do that rotation, I, I got a phone call saying that the clerkship was filled and there were no more slots and I had to figure out uh, uh, doing something else with my time. And so I, it, it, you know, it was, it was very late in the process. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary. Instead of doing the ear part, I'll do the eye part. And I literally just stumbled into ophthalmology. Um, I thought, well, two weeks, it's a small organ. I'll learn all I need to, to learn. Um, but um, I was smitten uh, the first day. Um, I loved the fact that um, uh, everything's quite detailed um, and um, you use all kinds of gadgets, uh, slit lamps, microscopes, lasers. Um, and um, the surgery is very delicate per se. And um, you can do a lot of good in a short period of time. Uh, patients are grateful. Um, doctors seem happy. Uh, for me, because I still wanted to do research, um, it was a way to, in, in some ways, practice the, the craft of being a clinician, but also having time to do, to do research as well. And I, I chose to do research in genetics uh, because of my, um, my early um, exposure to it, actually, at Bowdoin College with, you know, with uh, Dr. Steinhardt's um, supervision. Um, and uh, so, you know, I felt like all I knew was academics. And so after I finished um, both the, uh, the medical school and then the, um, you do a, a, a year of internship and I did that in uh, pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital. And then two years of, uh, uh, I'm sorry, three years of ophthalmology residency at University of Illinois in Chicago. And then two years of uh, pediatric ophthalmology oh. fellowship at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. I was finally spit out after 10 years of training um, and I knew nothing other than academics. So I, I, I chose an academic uh, medical career, um, going back to Boston Children's for that first career and, and starting up my first research lab and, and learning more uh, genetics uh, research, which had advanced tremendously by that point uh, because of the Human Genome Project in the 1990s. So I've, I've been an academic uh, uh, physician all my all my career. The MBA came later when I decided that maybe I could be a department chair and do a better job than uh, some of the experiences I had with department chairs, especially around um, uh, uh, mentoring and um, prom promoting people and actually enabling others to, to do their best, empowering them to um, uh, realize their career ambitions. I, I, that's a strong um, you know, ethos that I have that I didn't always find with, with other department chairs. So the MBA actually came uh, a little later in life. I was already a full professor at, at Duke. Um, and uh, quite honestly, it was just pushing um, into, you know, a, a sort of a, a later decade. So I, I was almost, um, uh, I was actually 50 at the time I, I, I got uh, or pursued the MBA did it at Duke because I was there already. It was a um, uh, a uh, uh, an MBA that took 18 months and um, a sort of one of those um, every other weekend, Friday, Saturday um, type um, MBA program. So you didn't have to physically be boots on the ground every single day with um, homework assignments in between. Um, and so with that, it, um, it enabled me to at least present to the ophthalmology world that I had the the chops or the skill sets to, you know, not only be a good academician um, in terms of being a, a researcher and a, a teacher, um, and also a good clinician, which they call the triple threat, but but had the the business acumen as well to to run a department. So sometimes people get MD MBAs right off the bat. I think for me, it was um, important, or, or just the way it, it, it played out. I, I, I had, um, I felt more, um, more intentional need and use and ways that I wanted to use an MBA than because I'd already had this experience as, a, as a, an academician and a uh, professor for some time in academic centers. 
uh, to be more focused about what I what I needed from that MBA. But you can you can do it either way. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, our next question is: How did Bowdoin prepare you for your career? And were there any examples of Black resilience that you faced at the college that became helpful in your career? Certainly. Well, you know, I started off at Bowdoin just like everybody else. Um, happy to be in college. Um, happy to be there uh, in particular. Um, I, um, even though I had the, the scholarship, I still had to work. And so I worked um, in the, the, the cafeteria. I worked um, stacking books in the library. Um, and I had to juggle all of that along with, you know, being on sports teams and, and um, having, um, you know, having the, the work um, that one needs to, to do for a major in, um, in, in the sciences in particular. Um, but I, I think that uh, resilience comes from um, a, a number of things, and they're, they're not things that are just particular to college. I, I believe that they're, they're, they're hopefully lifelong, uh, uh, not only habits, but, but beliefs. Um, the, the most important one is a belief in yourself. And what I share uh, when, I, when I give lectures about my career or, or just uh, my journey and or just um, inspirational lectures is there are five things. One is you need to know and feed your spiritual center and do that every single day. And in so doing, express, and, uh, express, express gratitude and count your blessings every single day, those that hurt as well as those that move you forward. Um, I think another thing is surrounding yourself with people that truly love you and support you and your ambitions. And I found those people at Bowdoin and I'll, I'll name them too as shout outs. Um, Kimberly Foster, Charles Patton, Gregory Jones, Marguerite McNeely and Charlotte Agell were my, my besties actually at, at Bowdoin. And um, you know we were all on this journey together trying to figure out who we were gonna become. But I think that if you surround your, pe yourself with people who are, are positive, who are, are forward thinking, that have your back, that get you, um, then, then you will, you will succeed. Um, the other thing that I've learned, and I, I guess it started there is that I, I realized that, um, especially that senior year, I, you know, I was a little aimless up until that point about my, my career, but, um, uh, those two professors, Dr. Settlemeyer and Steinhardt helped me to understand that I needed to be the CEO of my life, um, and my career. And so you need to find helpers um, both in your field of study, but also those that may not appear to be, say, a biochemist or a geneticist, but they they have some uh, background, say, in finances, so that you can you can make sure your finances are okay, because that's an, that's a uh, important uh, aspect of wellness as well. Um, and I think now more than ever, relationships are important. They're they're important for of course, nurturing you, but also important for um, your, your expanding network um, and for you know, helping you see uh, ways that you can grow in a, in a certain area, or they may help you, you know, for that next internship or that next job. Um, number four is just taking care of yourself. I think wellness is, is a real issue. I'm, I'm dealing with uh, physicians in my, in my group, in my practice that are experiencing burnout. And, um, I, I find that, you know, people are driven per se, but uh, you can't help anybody if, if, you're, if you're not well. Uh, so it's really important to, to exercise, to eat right, uh, to get some sleep, certainly not abuse your body per se with any experimental whatevers. Um, and, um, you know, uh, take some time to meditate and clear your head. And then the last thing I learned uh, at Bowdoin because it was um, extended to me is bringing others um, on your journey, um, others who are um, just starting their journey or, or need help or, or have a question or, or have a problem or can you know, work in your lab, um, just like somebody helped me by letting me work in their lab and, and uh, make mistakes. But um, you come to understand that those mistakes um, build character and, um, 
and also you um, you learn from them. So always bringing someone else or many others on your journey at any you know sort of spread of where they're at in their careers or or in their in their life journeys, I think is really important. Thank you so much. That's super helpful. Um, can you please speak on the impact of being both Black and a woman in your medical career? Um, yes. <laughs> I think that, um, you know, there are times where I almost refuse to kind of acknowledge that, just like, you know, just look at the work, look at the, the product, look at the the success, look at the results. Um, but I think that it's it's omnipresent. I think that um, what you can do is show the work and the results and the <laughs> and then just move on. I, I think sometimes some of these issues are 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 theirs. Um, but I I think that um, what it, it what it means uh, for us in particular is that you've got to choose courage. Um, you've got to be um, you, you've got to just put fear aside. Um, you've got to understand that you're there for a purpose, wherever there might be. It could be at a, in a boardroom. It could be um, in clinic with a patient who doesn't look like you and is kind of wondering, you know, what your skill sets are. It could be, quite honestly, with a nurse that keeps calling you honey and then looking at the resident who is 30 years younger than you are, but is male and Caucasian. Uh, and directing all the questions about your patient uh, to that person. Um, it, it could be that uh, you have a uh, you know grant rejected and you don't have a particularly good excuse for that. But I, I think that if you always uh, choose courage over fear, um, that you'll be able to overcome that. I think that um, we need to not play small. Um, it doesn't serve the world, it doesn't serve you. And um, whatever insecurities you have are actually people projecting that upon you. Uh, we're all meant to shine. We're all meant to to give. We're all meant. We all have a purpose. Um, and I think when you come into a room or come into a situation, you know, with that, you know, that sense of purpose, that sense of of um, of sharing, a sense of community, a, share, a sense of you that you want to be part of of this bigger picture you unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. Um, so just lead with courage. Thank you so much for your response, Terry. Uh, so we have another question for you. So who was your biggest supporter slash encourager on campus? Yes, well, I, I just named, uh, uh, you know, the, the two, um, science uh, professors and certainly uh, some of my best friends there. Uh, another one was Al Rosides, uh, who was a, a sociology professor. I, I had a, I had a, a sociology minor. Um, you know, he, he's a bit cynical um, and uh, uh, no doubt a, a socialist, uh, if you will. And, and for me, um, I, I needed, uh, I, you know, you, you just need to step outside of your your worldview, um, because your worldview is limited, uh, especially, you know, and um, college is one of those places where you can explore. Um, I, um, I, I found that I had a particular worldview, and I think we probably all have this, you know, this sensibility right now, uh, in, in light of what's transpired, uh, in terms of, you know, social issues in this country, and uh, what we're doing about it, that we were all miseducated in, in, in many ways. Um, and that education actually is up to us, um, and it's a lifelong process. It should be a lifelong process. But I, I would say, you know, uh, Settlemeyer, Steinhardt, and Rosides were really the uh, the, the leading uh, professors that helped me get outside of my head, which was very limited, very, you know, well uh, circumscribed. Um, and very safe, uh, quite honestly, to to learning about um, other things uh, about um, other people, or or certainly about myself and how I can contribute, uh, especially in the the bio biochemical biomedical genetics world that I I live in right now. 
Thank you so much. Um, our next question is, would you go to Bowdoin again? Why or why not? And is there anything that you would add to make it better? Sure, absolutely. Um, I have often said uh, to those that will listen, um, Bowdoin was my biggest blessing. I did not have, um, again, a, you know, sort of a family background where people went to college. I, um, you know, and I, I needed, I, I needed help to, to go to college and, and to stay in college. And, and Bowdoin uh, was there for me. Uh, not only did they help me in college, but uh, my, my latter two years of medical school at, at, um, at Harvard, another alum provided money to um, pay for tuition for any Bowdoin graduate who was either attending Harvard, um, Harvard Business School or Harvard Medical School, maybe Harvard Law School too. And so, you know, you get this phone call out of the blue. Um, would you like this scholarship to help pay your tuition for uh, medical school? I mean, I, 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 I suspect it's, you know, for all four years now, but it just happened to happen um, after I'd already finished two years of medical school. And it was like mana from heaven. Um, it, uh, it, it made me aware of how committed Bowdoin was to, to me, um, and uh, it it also made me aware of how Bowdoin was committed to what I will do uh, uh, with um, what I was given, and so yeah, no, I I um, very much am so grateful to to Bowdoin and again to the time that I had there, and um, I I would say absolutely, I you know I I think you know, you coming from Detroit, I, you know, I think I was sort of steered towards maybe uh, doing something more vocationally, if you will. I didn't quite grasp what a liberal arts education meant, but it, it means anything and everything, uh, whatever, whatever you want to explore. But knowing that even just those four years are not enough. It, it um, prepared me, I believe, to be a lifelong learner. Um, and, um, I just am so happy that that was at the beginning of my my uh, academic or uh, professional career journey. What would I change? I think I'm probably not um, uh, singular in this request um, because I am doing this now at University of Wisconsin in Madison. I, I think Bowdoin needs to diversify its leadership um, and its um, you know its academic. Um, you know, uh, staff, uh, and, um, and also, um, uh, more outreach, but I think physically on the campus, it needs to, it, it needs to diversify, um, its leadership in particular, because if that happens, uh, then, um, others will, will follow, uh, they'll see it as a place of, um, being welcoming to people with diverse perspectives and ideas and backgrounds. Um, but it will also, you know, expand its sensibilities, if you will, of, of its place uh, in, in this world. Thank you so much. It's super valuable. Um, I just wanted to send a quick reminder to all of the participants. If you have some questions, please feel free to uh, add that to the Q and A. Um, for our next question, I'd like to ask, what advice would you offer to young alumni about Black resilience as they embark on life and careers post Bowdoin? Yeah, courage, no fear. But I, I think there, there are, are certainly things to think about, you know, as you pursue your, um, you know, your, your line of work. Um, anybody who wants to be successful, I believe, it has, especially as a leader, has to be culturally aware. Um, that's so important now, I think, again, because fortunately, you know, boardrooms and um, different tables of leadership and, um, our, our clientele, our, in, in my case, our, our patient base, um, 
um, they're all, it's, it's a diverse uh, world and we need to be, um, we need to be uh, not only just say, okay, I know that's there, but um, be actively welcoming it and actively working on yourself um, to understand um, so that we can get past othering, we can get past bias and discrimination and get on with the work of, of truly helping each other. Um, I think you also need to be self-aware. Um, I think you need to real, really own your career. Um, I think to get ahead, you need to be a content expert. Uh, my area of expertise is genetics. And the way I, that came about was, um, remember when I said I really wanted to be a pediatrician? At Boston Children's Hospital, there was a ward that was called the Funny Looking Kid Ward. And I kid you not, that was that was the, the, the title. And this was back in the 80s. And I just thought we could just do so much better. We, we have the scientific means to really figure out why some kids, because of their genetics, look different. Um, and to, um, to work on that, to better categorize that, to find treatments for that. And so that was my impetus for being a content expert, if you will, in ophthalmic uh, genetics eventually. Um, so that's so important. Um, you've got to follow, you know, the money, <laughs> if you will. Um, and then another thing is always try to interdigitate what you're doing with, you know, other, uh, other areas of expertise. Um, as a, for instance, for my department, I've hired two biomedical engineers. One's now doing artificial intelligence work. The other is developing a, a, a Hubble-like microscope to, to look at um, to, to look at the, the retina in real time so that we don't have to take an eye out to actually look at you know, what happened after we, we did some treatment. And then I actually hired another person who is uh, an expert in nano, uh, nanotechnology or nanoparticles for you know, delivery of different therapies into the eye. These are not ophthalmologists, um, but nonetheless, what they're doing can be applicable to, to what we're doing or what we aspire to do. So try to figure out ways to cross pollinate with other, um, other disciplines, other practices. Um, and then I, I said all along uh, throughout this uh, discussion, commit to lifelong learning. It doesn't stop after college, it doesn't stop after grad school. Um, in, in point of fact, it only expands as you, um, you know, winnow in on what your interests are or winnow out or, or expand out. Um, you, you need to keep reading books. You need to keep talking to people. I believe you need to get on planes and uh, go to uh, distant countries and uh, learn about other people, how they do things, their perspectives, their religions, their food, um, their practices, um, because that only expands your worldview and um, you bring back ideas that um, that you can use uh, in whatever uh, practice or whatever uh, discipline that you might be in. Um, the other thing I would say is take on stretch assignments. Don't just do the work that you're given. Um, volunteer to do other things um, because you'll learn from that. Um, you'll be certainly viewed as somebody who um, is committed to the, the enterprise um, and those assignments will give you other assignments. Um, and um, I think that that's, that's really important not, not to sit at a table and be a potted plant, but to, to really to speak out and, um, and share your perspective because it is valuable. Thank you so much. Um, our last question before we move to Q&A. Um, as a medical professional, what are your thoughts on the intersection of health and Black resilience? Yes. So, and that's being discussed in all sorts of levels. I have the privilege now being on uh, the board of um, some of our leading ophthalmology or vision science uh, uh organizations, if you will, as, as well as on the board of the, um, it's called the American uh, uh, Association of University Professors in Ophthalmology. It's, it's all the department chairs of ophthalmology in this country. 
who come together once a year, along with uh, many members of their leadership team for their particular departments to, to talk about um, how to make or move forward uh, academic, make academic ophthalmology better, move it forward. Um, the uh, issues that I'm working on are getting more people that look like me into ophthalmology. Uh, we are third from the bottom uh, in terms of um, underrepresented minorities in ophthalmology. And um, what I mean by that is that we're only eclipsed by orthopedics and radiology, um, but other different uh, clinical disciplines have a, a far better track record than we do. Um, just as uh, uh, yeah, a metric, uh, only 6% of uh, individuals in this country are underrepresented minorities in ophthalmology. And that includes those in academics as well as those in private practice. And as you know, that doesn't um, reflect or mirror the uh, percentage of underrepresented minorities in, in this country. Uh, so that's a big, uh, that's a big deal. Uh, we're, we've established some very different types of pipeline programs now, uh, starting in medical school, and also now in, in residency training. Um, we, um, uh, I have actually developed one with um, a, uh, a colleague at Johns Hopkins to help um, underrepresented minorities who, are, who choose academic careers actually stay in academic careers because they're not um, necessarily being uh, promoted at the same rates or, um, uh, mentored uh, for sure. And so um, we have now an informal um, uh, program uh, that meets at night uh, virtually just to just to help um, support people in, in that regard. Um, one thing that I think is really important that I'm working on now along with colleagues at the AUPO is to abolish uh, what um, we see in some academic programs in this country, and that is what I call a separate but equal circumstance of having what's called a residency run clinic that's just run by trainees, and then a private practice clinic per se that's run by uh, academic attendings or academic faculty. The faculty are, are supervising the residents, but as you can imagine, um, there are in, inequities in everything from physical space to uh, the types of diagnostic equipment. And, and of course, just having a, a trainee who is uh, the one who is the primary doctor for a patient who may or may not have an issue that's a chronic issue. Residents rotate through, so um, that patient comes back and they see a, a different trainee who's taking care of them. And unfortunately in this country, and I, I'm just gonna expose this, uh, those residency run clinics are primarily clinics that are uh, relegated to uh, people of color, um, people who um, uh, some generally have, um, are, have no insurance or are underinsured or sometimes don't even have the right kind of insurance. And then we've got our faculty actually running their own private practice clinics, if you will, uh, which are very different in surroundings, uh, milieu, uh, resources, um, and of course, having somebody who's experienced running that clinic. And I'm just exposing this. This is something that I'm working on very hard with, with other colleagues who, who see the disparities now um, and are, are working against this as well. So that's a big, it's a big deal. It's really a big deal because it's it's a it it has to, you know, the, the practice model has to change for an entire department. Um, I see this as essential not only for the patient, but I also see it as essential for the learners. They coming into a situation like this would see this as they, they this would be no, this would be normal. This it normalizes that kind of disparate type of practice, a separate but equal practice, and then they go on to perpetuate that. So I think it's important that we do it for that reason as well. And I would suspect that one of the reasons why we're having so much trouble getting folks uh, to consider ophthalmology um, as a career choice in medical school is that 
if they come to our clinics, they also see this disparity and want nothing to do with it. Um, they, they, they see that we have this segregated um, uh, delivery of care and, and certainly don't want to um, perpetuate that and or it, it's an obvious turnoff. So I'm exposing this as well. Thank you, Terry. We are going to be moving into our Q&A section. Um, and I'll start with the first question. Um, what is your advice for prospective undergrads interested in pre-med work, but have had no exposure to a magnet school setting or the equivalent and may find the curriculum daunting? They, uh, they have no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I missed your question. But... No, I, I can restate it. Yeah. Uh, so what is your advice for prospective undergrads interested in pre-med work, but have had no exposure to a magnet school setting or any equivalent and may find the curriculum daunting? So okay. namely young people from marginalized socioeconomic backgrounds. Understood, a magnet school setting is what you said. Yeah, yes. no, um, well, I, you have to you have to do the work. I mean, you have to be you have to do all the pre-med requirements, which are are heavily uh, you know sort of mathematics as well as um, science. Um, and so I'm I yeah, and, and I guess it, it suggests that because I had this magnet school setting, I was I was well prepared to you know to do the research uh, to do the work in in college. I studied. <laughs> I, um, you know, I, I, I studied alone. I studied with study partners. Um, I asked for help uh, when I needed it. Um, I, coming from, you know, public school in Detroit, going to Bowdoin, I felt quite intimidated. Um, uh, most of my classmates, especially the pre-meds, you know, had attended private schools. They had tutors, you know, all their life. Um, it, it, from the outside perspective looking in, it, it looked easy. It, it looked like it was easy for them. Um, I, um, I, I think that, you know, asking for help early and regularly is a good thing. Um, you have to begin where you're at. I mean, it, it's, it, and you can't be regretful of what you didn't have before. You just have to to begin where you are. And actually, I, I say that all the time for, um, you know, leading my department. Let's just begin where we're at because you, you, can't, you, can't, you can't do anything else other than that. Um, in so doing, you can, you can certainly decide what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are and then find um, resources and people to, to help you with your weaknesses. But um, to say, well, I didn't go to a magnet school, so therefore I can't do this. It, it's it's already spilt milk in a way, or yeah. So just begin where you're at. Um, I probably fared well because I wasn't a pre med. I, I didn't put that extra pressure on myself because I didn't know better. Those first three years of of college, I just loved science, and I think if you come at it that way rather than um, a do or die situation that this is absolutely what I need to be, um, then you're loving things because you love to learn, not because, you know, there's, there's just this carrot at the end or, or this brass ring at the end, because getting into medical school is one thing you've got to get out of medical school and then you've got to, you've got to help patients. So it's, it's, it's sort of a long road. And um, there's certainly milestones you have to, to make, but I think the important thing is try to um, try to be a lifelong learner and learn because you love the material. Um, because I think that's really, I, I don't know, that's my perspective. I would say that's the best way to do it, but it's my perspective. Thank you. Um, for our next Q&A question is, um, what is next in terms of career for you? And what advice do you have for balancing your home or personal life and your career? Yeah, that's interesting. What's next for career for me? Well, I have to be honest, I've been looking at some, uh, maybe some dean opportunities, but I've also been looking at uh, ways that our department can expand, expand more 
uh, in terms of global health. Um, and that, that takes some effort as well. You know, since I've been here for eight years uh, here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and um, we now have partnerships with um, Shroff's Charity Eye Hospital in, in Delhi, India. I have uh, residents that, uh, the senior residents travel there um, and they literally just got back. <laughs> For some reason, we always have these travels in February. I don't know why in Wisconsin, maybe, maybe there's something to that, but um, they, uh, they travel with a uh, faculty member or two uh, and so it makes for a learning experience and a, a, a continuous education experience. Um, they go there, they see patients, they do surgeries, they go to outreach um, uh, missions um, outside of Delhi, where they examine patients in a, in a you know a school uh, or or a uh, you know sort of the the center you know kind of a community center or something like it's just kind of like pop-up settings and any patient needs uh, further care, we bring them back on a bus to Delhi for um, usually, you know, eye surgery and then for post-operative care. So they're learning um, a different way of, of uh, healthcare delivery. Um, and and what, I, what I say is that they're using their privilege for good um, and they're actually understanding how privileged they are. Um, so I have rev rev uh, residents that go there, they, they go to Sao Paulo, Brazil, and they are also now are going to uh, uh, Manila in the, uh, the Philippines. Um, my thinking now is to expand uh, to the Caribbean. And so, you know, I'm balancing, you know, what should I do next with um, maybe expanding our reach um, and hopefully our goodness, um, to, you know, to other parts of the world that don't you know, don't have ophthalmic care the way we have it in this country. Um, so that's that's what's next. Um, how do I balance what I do with my personal life? As I said, surround yourself with people who truly love you and support you and your ambitions. I was uh, an athlete when I started Bowdoin, and I'm still an athlete. I I do do yoga and biking and. Um, walking and hiking and, you know, some workouts, things like that, because I, I think it's really important to, you know, to keep up with taking care of yourself. And um, I, I just really enjoy um, being around uh, positive people, I, you know, the spiritual base I mentioned as well. Um, those are things that are really, uh, truly important, not only just for your time in college, but for, you know, for, for your, for your life. Uh, so I, I think it's just really important to take care of yourself. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is, what does owning your career look like? And what examples can you share around this for current students and young alumni? Well, I, I think if you think of yourself as a business, actually, you're the CEO of that business, right? So that CEO has got to think about um, strategic planning. <laughs> um, I think that you need to be thinking about what your goals are for the next year, the next five years, the next 10 years. Um, that business needs to be financed. So you, I, I think financial wellness and how you're going to, you know, kind of like keep up yourself um, with housing and food and um, all the other things that need to happen in order for you to be, um, you know, a functioning um, individual in the workforce. Um, you need to, as I said, keep up with the reading. Uh, I mean, if you're, if you've got a business, you're, you're hopefully you've got people that are out there learning about other ways to do uh, things uh, and they're bringing it back and you're incorporating that. So you're always innovating. So there's gotta be like a chief innovation officer a chief financial officer, um, a chief um, uh, medical officer, in my case, somebody who will, you know, take care of your fitness and your wellness, uh, probably a chief spiritual officer. Just think of yourself as a business. And so if you're doing that, you, as a business, you're, you're going to, you're going to want to innovate. You're going to want to establish partnerships. You're certainly going to want to have goals. Uh, you're you're going to want to stay financially solvent. Um, uh, you're going to want to grow. 
So, you know, all those hats you wear and you have expertise in some of those, but not all of them, but you can always find other people who can help you. Um, so think of yourself as, as, um, as a CEO of your life and of your career. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. <laughs> uh, this next question is coming from someone who is a class of 97 and is a veterinary ophthalmologist. So someone adjacent in the field. Uh, yeah. the, the question is, what is the pediatric condition that you find most rewarding for you to treat in a clinical setting? Or what condition you feel makes you feel like you produce the most good? Thank you for that question. And I, I thank you so much for, for being a veterinary ophthalmologist because I have two in my department I, uh, as faculty members. Um, and they bring an entirely different perspective in terms of having animal models that actually harbor genetic disorder. And so one has a, a glaucoma animal model. It's a cat or uh, feline animal model with glaucoma. Um, and the other actually is using dogs as a surrogate for humans um, in, in aging. So, you know, a dog's basically in the same environment. They're seeing the same things. They're, you know, not necessarily eating the same food, but um, how do they, what, what kinds of ways are they getting um, visual information that a human would be getting as well? And how, how, does, that, how does that change with, with aging? So thank you for, for for doing what you do. Um, as I mentioned, I was struck by uh, how um, children actually had genetic disorders that were not necessarily understood when I was um, a medical student and then went on to do uh, uh, an internship in pediatrics and then went on to eventually become a pediatric ophthalmologist. And so I actually uh, uh, was one of the, the first uh, to start this field called ophthalmic genetics. Um, and it was both in the clinical realm and in the, in the research realm. Um, before it was, you know, kind of something, you know, you, you dabbled in a little bit or it seemingly was acknowledged as being important, but you couldn't do anything about it. We, you know, um, if somebody was born with a particular inherited issue, that was, you know, that was it. Um, that, that was something they had to live with. But as you um, come to understand gene mutations and the biology behind that, then you can develop therapies. Either they could be molecular therapies or we can actually alter the genetic machinery so that mutation doesn't happen again. Um, and or there could be stem cell therapies to in, in, in some ways replace that tissue that's diseased with, with uh, new younger tissue that we call pluripotential. It still, it still has a potential to develop into that specific tissue, but as a as as a as like a newborn baby, you know, it's 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 not it's not marred anymore. Uh, if you will, it's 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 brand new, baby-ish tissue or stem cell tissue that um, we can use to replace disease tissue. So we're we're finding different ways to do that. So my my so I've been a gene hunter all my life. I've run a genetics lab for not all my life, all my my professional career, a genetics uh, lab for twenty five years now. Um, I've always run small labs. So I've got five people in my lab. And um, I've had the privilege of uh, seeing patients with different um, inherited eye disorders or whole body genetic disorders. And they've um, allowed me to find out about their family history, um, uh, take blood for uh, DNA extraction for them as well as other family members, and then to study that in, in the lab. Um, and of late, um, We've been doing a lot of work with congenital glaucoma uh, or childhood glaucoma, which people say kids can get glaucoma and absolutely they can. Uh, it's absolutely devastating in a child uh, compared to an adult. It's devastating anyway. But in a child, um, glaucoma is a situation where the uh, eye pressure is higher or 
uh, greater inside the eye than outside the eye. And in a child, because the eye is supposed to grow anyway, it expands like a balloon. The walls are distensible. And in so doing, the eye gets much bigger um, and the contents inside the eye become disorganized. And um, you can uh, have irreparable um, visual loss from that. And it's one of the leading causes for children uh, presenting at um, schools for the blind in, in this country and in other countries. So if we can figure out a way to thwart that, um, that, that really is intervening um, significantly and changing the course of somebody's life. Um, it's a course of whatever schooling they might get, whatever vocation they might choose, and you know, obviously downstream with whatever kinds of partnerships they might have, or whatever kinds of experiences they, they will be able to in, enjoy in life. So we've been very successful lately with finding mutations for um, different kinds of childhood glaucoma. Um, and that's because I've had 25 years to, to basically, you know, um, fill up my freezer uh, with with DNA with all these families that I've I've had the the, the great privilege of of taking care of over all these years, and we we're now starting to develop therapies, uh, you know, for a couple of these uh, glaucoma gene mutations that we found. That's so exciting! Thank you for sharing. Yeah. So that concludes our Q&A portion. On behalf of the college and BCBAA, we appreciate you, Dr. Young, and everyone who attended today's Black History Month conversation. Thank you all so much. Thank you.